Television Podcast, brought to you by SOMEX, where we break down the health tech news every single week. I'm Jessica, and I'm not only joined, as usual, by my colleague Hugh and our fantastic producer, Adama, but we have a new recruit on the airwaves today. And I have to say, her setup is looking eminently more professional than mine and showing us all up. So welcome, Amy, who's just joined the SOMEX team. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm doing good. And yeah, I, I feel like now I have to say something equally as professional sounding as, as my microphone looks. So um, yeah, I do have quite a good setup here. But um, thank you for having me. It's my first Pigeon podcast and I'm happy to be here. First of many, and we are excited to put you through your paces, ask you some really challenging questions um, that we forgot to ask you in your interview. Um, so oh. <laughs> I'm only joking, I'm only joking. We are here to have fun. That is the aim of the game. Have fun and obviously talk about health tech. Um, and yeah, I am really excited about this week's edition because there is a lot to talk about. So why don't we just jump into our first story? Sounds good. I'm sure everyone has seen that the government has launched a consultation, a public consultation, to help shape the 10-year health plan. Now, this story is brought to us from Digital Health. It's been reported very, very widely. Uh, I've had a look at the press release and I'd like to, like to start by saying I have never seen so many comments from so many different people, so many different spokespeople in a single press release. that has got to be some kind of record, but it looks like it's got great support. For those of you who don't know, over here in the UK, the new Labour government has launched this consultation with members of the public, with people who work in the NHS and other experts to get their views on things that we can do to improve the NHS and improve care over here in the UK. Now, I think that this has been met with some scepticism, I will say. So the way that this has been positioned is that it sounds as if there have been some plans made already. So as I was seeking to understand a little bit more about this, it talks about, uh, Wes Reeton talks about how Obviously, there's a lot that's great about the NHS, but there's a lot that we know needs to change. We know that is a health system that is under pressure. Keir Starmer goes on to say that we have a clear plan to fix the health service, but it's only right that we hear from people who rely on the NHS every day to have their say and shape our plan as we deliver it. Now, that says to me that there is already something of a plan, which makes this whole initiative interesting potentially questionable because I guess my my big question would be if there is a plan surely it would make best sense for people to be able to provide their perspectives on it rather than having a plan and bringing lots of new ideas to the fore and there's also no real clear indication of how the submissions from members of the public people working in the NHS and other experts will be brought into the process and how that will actually practically help shape this plan. You may have seen that there's a very interesting platform that has been created that allows people to submit their suggestions and you can publicly see some of those suggestions. So I guess before we get into some of those suggestions. I'm keen to hear from Hugh and Amy, your perspectives on this and whether or not you think, what's the intention here? Is it to truly shape a plan or is it for PR? What do you reckon? Yeah, same questions came up in my mind when I was reading the story. Um, it, it just seems that there's a slightly lack of information like on how exactly these comments and perspectives are going to be used because you know, we all know that there's going to be a lot of information to sift through so much data. Some of it will be useful, some of it might not be useful. But there is a lack of, I think, uh, information on how exactly that's going to happen, um, how they're going to categorize those recommendations, how will they bring that into the plan. Also, um, other issues around avoiding sort of 
bias perspectives and um, vetting people that are, that are sort of adding information to the platform and, and all sorts of issues um, that could come from sort of opening this so widely. So yeah, there's that part. And then also uh, the engagement aspect, you know, it is interesting to see, you know, the sharing of certain statements on, on Twitter and online, uh, which is obviously adding to this momentum around the platform. So interesting to kind of maybe unpick a little bit the motivations behind that and what might happen. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll caveat this with the fact that every NHS announcement and every NHS major program for the last couple of years now, I've jumped onto this podcast and I said, oh, well, they always talk about public engagement and we never, we never really see the evidence of it. It's always these kind of quite niche groups that they go to for representation of the public perspective. And, and I, you know, I have in the past criticised government for not doing these wider public engagement exercises. That said, this reminds me why they don't. Um, and I think what we're looking at here is something that screams as if it was a, a consultation for experts, a consultation for the workforce. And then someone went, can we turn this into a public engagement exercise without making too many changes? And it's very clear across the board that you've got really defined surveys. If you look at the consultation itself that goes alongside this kind of suggestions platform or you know, online suggestion box for the NHS that they've um, built on this. It's really quite well defined and there are some really insightful, some might say leading questions uh, that they want people's answers from, but largely that's for the workforce and the experts. There's a lot of, uh, my favourite thing is that it opens up with, uh, what are the top three things about the NHS? Just, just put in what you like. And then when we get to the kind of the more public side of things, it's describe your experiences. Like that's it. There's a really nice big box for anyone to put in their, their views alongside into the consultation alongside the suggestions platform. It feels as if there's no real plan for what to do with all of these suggestions. It's, you know, it's, it would be nice to know more what they're going to do, but ultimately someone will have to actually categorize and go through these. And I really, really don't envy the policy offer so that NHS England who will have to sit down and go through this. This this, uh, this approach would never have been taken before ChatGPT came in to actually filter and go through sentiment. Um, so kind of exciting to see. I mean, I, I know why they're doing it. Darcy report came out um, a couple of months ago now. Um, there's a 10-year plan coming up and they, they do want to show that they have undertaken an engagement exercise, but it feels like it's a sort of half-hearted on the public side, even if some of the questions and some of the insights will probably be quite useful on the workforce and the expert side. It's interesting because it, when I first heard about it, I thought it's it's a great, it seems like a great idea. It's like, let's get everyone's opinions. Let's get everyone to feed in people who are using the NHS. But yeah, it seems like also I was thinking, you know, people who are most likely to need the NHS and use the NHS or might be in communities that are particularly hard to reach um, or disadvantaged communities? Like, is there a strategy or a plan for reaching out to them to making sure that their opinions are included as well? Because it doesn't seem to sort of be talked about at all accessing the platform and people who might not have access or won't have access to it. So yeah, all sorts of questions, but it's definitely an interesting idea. Quite a nice idea. <laughs> I suppose I, it, it's it's reassuring to know that, that you know there is at least a, a quantitative survey that that comes alongside this, and I I think you know as as a concept this this platform platform where people can free form throw out ideas about things that they think the NHS should do is a great way to get people engaged. I think. Though, because it is so freeform, there aren't categories. It is really just, as I said, a free for all. Um, to your point, Hugh, it makes it makes analysis of that specific part quite challenging. And whilst on some level it's quite fun for some people, others submitting, you know, some very serious and thoughtful suggestions. Um, how do you how do you make that useful? Um, and how do you quantify it further than sentiment? And you know, listeners might be disappointed to hear that I got really distracted in my preparation for today's podcast 
because I was just stuck in a perpetual scroll hole looking through Twitter and Instagram about some of the more outlandish recommendations um, that have been put forward. And actually, I'll just share a couple with you because I've been laughing out loud to myself. I'll read out some of them that are appropriate for a podcast such as ours. There are some that most definitely are not. Okay, the first one, A&E needs a go-home man. Not sure why it needs to be a man, but you know, a go-home person. Uh, and statistics should be reported correctly. Someone recounting a very fair experience of where they've been sat in any with their partner who had a head injury and there were lots of people coming in that clearly didn't need emergency care and were just there because they wanted to get some kind of help um and just how busy that made the um a and e department i will skip that one um I think a standout favourite that I've seen everywhere and probably one of the most sensible is uh, Larry the Cat for Health Secretary. Sorry, Wes Struting. Um, but he, he's looking very, very dapper in his Union Jack bow. Um, someone said, put me in charge. I have some bright ideas and a can-do attitude. I think I have... I can have a good crack at this. Give me a good few months and I reckon I can sort this mess out. I really like that confidence. Someone else says ban apples from hospital. I'm not really sure why, but in the next breath, someone else is suggesting and in, incent, incentivizing people for free annual cake if you don't use the NHS. I think there might be some mixed messages there. <laughs> a personal favorite, put memes and funny tweets on hospital walls and GP surgeries. Putting memes on the walls of NHS hospitals and GP surgeries could really help lift the spirits of both patients and staff. A bit of humour, e.g. a meme such as a rickroll, this person's really showing their age, uh, or tweets by Johnny Sharples, Scott Chegg and Josh Pearson can really go a long way to brightening up what can be a tough and serious environment for people. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm... laughs> for people saying something <laughs> funny just might take their minds off their worries, even if just for a moment. For doctors and nurses, it's a little reminder that it's okay to have a laugh amidst hard work, and it will help everyone feel more connected and lightening the mood during those otherwise long and oppressive days. You know, that's not a bad idea. I do love a good meme and a gif. You know, if it lightens the mood then um ideal weirdly specific about whose like means and gifts they should be though like tweets <laughs> yeah. from specific people <laughs> yeah. which... and, and can we say not very not very inclusive there and the final one make people clap back during covid we saved the nhs by clapping didn't we so to speed up any waiting times just make everyone clap at a solid eight beats per minute this will result in greatly enhanced staff morale Okay, I'll finish on this one. Change the name of the NHS to, <laughs> to NHAC, NHSC Muck NHS Face. <laughs> Sorry. Put it to a public vote. <laughs> there are literally tens of us in favour of this. Um, tens. <laughs> tens. And That's a really substantial uh, amount. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> ban onions and celery for the good of public health. They're not, they're not food and nothing good ever comes from eating them. Well, there we go. Some solid some solid recommendations for how we save the NHS. Um, <laughs> well, if nothing else, how we boost morale. And yeah. I think perhaps, you know what, we do, uh, the, the clapping for the NHS, I think has probably drawn a bit of criticism. And in, in many ways, rightly so. But I think at the time it served a purpose that raised everyone's morale. And I think it's admirable that people are exploring new ideas that, um, for how we can do that and you know for some of those even you know the gifts and the memes it's nice to see that people care and appreciate doctors and nurses and see them as human beings too that need humor in their life so yeah I think uh, I will may I'm thinking about maybe starting a content series idea of the week to save the NHS uh, <laughs> just on LinkedIn um, maybe people can vote and I can submit that quantitative data um, to, to, the, uh, to the consultation. Uh, that can be my, my contribution. One other thing I did want to pick up on, though, um, all jokes aside, was the other thing that this statement said was that, well, two things, actually. First of all, they want to focus on hospital to community, analogue to digital and sickness to prevention. We know those aren't new concepts. We know they've been around for a long time. The intention has been there for a while. Um, my, my thinking on that is that, again, what would probably help people is some more 
tangible suggestions of how that could look. I think it particularly for people, the public, who don't have the understanding of the way the NHS works as a machine um, and how everything fits together, seeing some of those examples might support them in being able to contribute in a more meaningful or more, more informed way. Um, and the other thing is as well, it sets out this intention that we have heard quite a few times before. A single patient record summarising patient information, test results and letters in one place through the NHS app to make records available across all NHS trusts, GP surgeries and ambulances. Now, again, admirable, but we have heard it numerous times before. And I think we talk about interoperability a lot as being one of the huge issues, data interoperability, that has perhaps prevented this from happening in the past. But before we move on to a different story that's perhaps less fun, um, I'm keen to hear from both of you your perspectives on that intention and what you think makes Labour think that this time is going to be different. We're not like the other guys. That's a tricky one. That's a tricky one, Jessica. Um, I mean, the intention's there, which is good. Um, we have heard it before that we're going to be bringing it into one system. I think there are just so many, there are so many moving parts um, with digital transformation in the NHS and it is complicated. And I think um, it's fine to acknowledge that and say that it might be a bit tricky and that it's not going to be super easy to get it super slick. So, you know, I think we have to kind of have a healthy degree of skepticism around maybe the timescales of it and actually the functionality of how it will work in practice and rolling that out to all of the different places and the different trusts and everything and patients and everybody getting on board with, with using the system, um, like the actual technology rollout. And it would be good to, to hear more, I guess, more detail on how exactly the government plan to do that and what's different now like what's the new innovation what's the new technology what's what's going to allow it to to be quicker and be slick and actually kind of get done this time yeah i mean 100 percent behind everything in that and alongside that you've got to get the will the time the money um and give people the space to actually make the change yeah there's an argument out there that it's it's fully possible um, but who is it? You know, you know, what, what solution is it? What, what practically, as Amy said, does it look like? And who wins out from this move, from this change? And who loses out? Because there will be a lot of losers, um, from any big centralization of the health record. Um, and I think politically, that's a much bigger challenge than just let's do it. Yeah, it's a good point. There are hundreds literally hundreds of companies who and innovators who are looking to tackle this challenge and are trying to tackle this challenge of a centralized record of a consolidated electronic health record um and even as i think about uh, you know my personal experience going through pregnancy right now so i use the nhs app i receive my letters on the nhs app and it's the first time i've actually really used it in any meaningful way and I was quite surprised at how well that worked. <laughs> um, but really and truly, all I do is get my letters on there. And there is actually some medical history on there. Um, so some of my notes have have passed over from my previous um, primary care provider, I believe, but not any secondary care information. But alongside that, I'm using the Badger app for my maternity care. So on the Badger app, I've got my, I also have my letters um, I'm supposed to have ultrasound scans on there, but the scans aren't on there. It just says that they happened and that the scan isn't available. Um, and I've got all of my test results, so blood tests, urine tests, um, like fundal measurements, all of that kind of thing. Um, and I believe that there's probably another app that I was supposed to download as well that gives me some different information. Um, and for me, even just having those two apps was quite a game changer to be able to see all of that. I have friends equally who are in different parts of the country who have to take around a paper folder of their notes to 
every appointment. And once they had their baby, those notes were taken from them. So then they don't personally have that information to hand, which I find really sad. And in fact, one of my friends recently said that they got their notes back and found out some information about um, what happened to their child during birth that they weren't aware of, um, that was actually quite terrifying. So maybe it's better they didn't know at the time, but the fact is they didn't have that information um, and it was all in, in paper form. And so it goes to show how even having those two apps has been really game changing. Imagine having it in one app, amazing. Um, but actually some people are still having to rely on paper. Um, and I guess my my big worry with this one is that we have, we're barely out of the controversy of the FDP. Um, and that was a similar big infrastructure program that we have heard, it's all gone very quiet. We've heard very little on. Um, and I, those kinds of programs and projects are always going to have their critics. There's always going to be winners and losers. Um, and I think to Hugh's point, of course, there is going to end up being, there will be a lot of companies who it could be make or break for them, um, I think, because there's not going to be room for hundreds of players. There's going to be some consolidation. Um, but I'm interested to see how it gets handled by the Labour government and, and the Department of Health and hope that they perhaps have learned from that um, FTP process. Uh, but I think also to Amy's point, you know, without more information, it's very hard to draw any real conclusions. And that seems to be the, the underlying theme of the this um, consultation and, and some of these statements that have been made in, in this release, which is that, you know, it's kind of teasing us with a little bit of information and they've set out some intentions, but it's really hard to draw any judgments about how successful it might be or what conclusions might be drawn without them providing a bit more. And my personal opinion is that they probably could have given us a bit more information at this point. Yeah, agreed. It'd be really interesting to see what comes out of the, the consultation like, and how they use the data, because there could be some, some quite interesting results that they could, but um, we'll have to kind of see how it evolves over time. I'd love if there's some wild card choices. Oh, yeah. I really hope that Larry the cat becomes a uh, health secretary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> change things up a bit, you know. But yeah, I think in true government form, they haven't even committed to when the consultation is going to close. They've just said early 2025. And they've committed even less to when we will hear the results saying that um, they will be published in spring 2025, which probably gives them up until when do the clocks change like June? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be, you know, it'd be great. It'd be a great story if, if, if they had like a recommendation, if they had a recommendation from someone or a group of people that they've categorized and it was actually implemented and actually helped people, that would be a, a really cool story, I think for the NHS. But until that part sort of happens, it's, it's, uh, yeah, seems a little, a little way off that, uh, that part. Well, it might be a way off, but rest assured, we'll be here to talk about it when it does happen. And invariably, there will be some good news stories that comes out of this. I, I have no doubt. Um, you know, it's always going to be a mixed bag. But ultimately, I think we can remain somewhat optimistic. And um, maybe the NHS will also be rena renamed. Watch this space. We shall see. Perhaps we'll report some breaking news. But... On that note, let's move on to our second story of the day. Well, second story of the day is another one on the NHS. Sorry, global listeners, we will be coming to something global, relevant to us all in no time at all. And uh, maybe next week we'll make a special effort to be way more inclusive. But right now, the NHS is a hot topic over here in the UK. And the next hot topic is that apparently NHS patients are more willing to miss a hospital appointment than a hairdresser's appointment or indeed 
a personal training appointment. New research from our friends over at Dr. Doctor has revealed. Now, this again has been reported pretty widely. Uh, we've got coverage here in digital health. We've also got coverage in the Telegraph. So it's a big story um, around people's perspectives and attitudes, I think, to the NHS. And maybe it's kind of a build on what we've been talking about and some of those submissions that that we've seen around people's attitudes and um, how much people care about the NHS, I suppose. And I just wonder whether, you know, the hairdressers, personal trainers, they are not free at the point of care. Um, there is definitely a cost associated with that. And perhaps that is behind some of the intentions. But rather than me speculating, as I told you, my uh, preparation for today's podcast stop, started and stopped on TikTok, scrolling through those consultation ideas. So, Amy, what do you think is behind this research? Well, an interesting point um, to raise, I think, is actually just picking up on what you said about um, people's attitudes towards the NHS and missing appointments and costs and all of that. Um, so, so some of the, the headlines of the, the Telegraph piece obviously are le leaning towards that uh, that stance, I suppose, of you know how much how much do people care compared to other things that they're they're paying for and 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 seemingly needing to attend, like hairdressers and personal trainers. However, um, in digital health, um, they actually reveal a little bit more granular detail around uh, the reasons why people are missing, which is quite interesting to dig into um, because it actually reveals perhaps a little bit more than what we would maybe assume from the surface. So they have reported that 50% of the respondents did not attend because of travel related challenges. Now, I haven't seen the original data, so worth looking into that of what that actually means, but maybe there's something a little bit more that meet, than meets the eye um, to missing the appointments um, than just a lack of, I don't know, what travel related challenges could mean. It could be stuck in traffic. It could be, I can't get there. Um, but also maybe that's also a bit of a, uh, maybe it's a bit of a cop out for people to kind of tick that box and say, oh, it's a travel related problem. But if it was your PT, or your hairdresser, would you also have the same travel related problem? Clearly not. So interesting, the reasons why people are missing them. But it clearly is a big problem. I just guess to, to pick up on that, that travel thing, though, that is super interesting. And I think there's two points that that really come to the fore for me in that. And the first is that um, the ge geographic location of where people are receiving care versus where they find a hairdresser or even a personal trainer. And, you know, hospitals aren't, uh, and I say hospitals, it's, I don't think this study is necessarily just talking about hospital appointments, but it shows that hospital appointments in particular are the ones that people are most likely to miss or be less bothered about missing. Hospitals don't tend to be in the most accessible places. They're not on the high street. Um, actually, from a public transport perspective, when you consider how accessible they are, pretty much not, you know, bus services are relatively infrequent. I don't know how many are that close to train stations, but train travel is super expensive. Um, how else do people get there, public transport wise? I mean, taxis are also expensive. Um, yeah. And it, even if you're driving there yourself, you know, as I said, we've been to the hospital on multiple occasions in the last nearly eight months. And every time parking is a problem, we've, you know, driven round and round and round um, a car park just trying to find a space. And not only is it hard to find a space, but it's really expensive when you get there. And so I think that it, it does pose a really interesting question about a like cost of travel potentially being a barrier for some people um and you know that begs the question around you know even is that widening health inequities for people who perhaps don't have their own transport or don't have the financial resources to be able to pay to get there or pay to park for example um or also people who perhaps Bearing in mind, hospital appointments, hospitals generally treat people who are more sick than 
GPs. Um, and they might there might be some challenge with mobility, you know, and, and how sick they are and, you know, being able to get themselves there or having someone to be able to bring them and take time off work and all of those kinds of things that all factors into travel. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think that travel point is is super interesting that it could quite easily be a cop out, but I actually think that in itself is multifactorial. Um, whereas, you know, where I live, I think there's probably about five hairdressers on the high street. There's a load of different places where I can go and work out, should I choose to, all within walking distance. Yet to go to the hospital, if the traffic's not bad, it will take me 20 minutes to get there. And that's lucky. We're, we're really close. Um, but then add on parking and all of those kinds of things that actually there's far more friction to get to a, a healthcare appointment than there is perhaps for other types of appointments. Mm. I actually thought that that statistic was in some ways quite positive because it, if if that is the reason, there's actually some things we can do. Or you, th- mm. you think that the, the NHS and the government can do. And one, one of the things they've mentioned that they're doing is trialling the use of Uber to help transport mm. patients to and from medical appointments if they're considered likely to miss it. Um, so that's an interesting idea mm. and, you know, perhaps not a bad one, um, mm. considering that I think it was 8 million people missed their appointments. Um, 8 million patients missed a scheduled appointment in 23, 24, um, mm. which is just a huge amount of money and time, mm. um, for the NHS. Yeah. I suppose as well, there are, there are also existing patient transport services that are available, but. I certainly, and maybe it's because I've never been in a position where I need one, but I wouldn't be able to tell you how to access them or arrange that. And um, I wonder whether there's, that begs the question that there's also an education and awareness um, problem to solve, which again is a positive thing because we can do that, that makes it far easier for people to access the services that can help them um, overcome those, those travel challenges as well. Interestingly, the other stat from the survey is that 42% of respondents didn't attend appointments because of anxiety, appointment anxiety, Hmm. which is... That's quite a huge number. ...is a big proportion of people. Um, Hmm. And again, there isn't much more detail that I have to hand around what that actually entails, but hmm, surely there's some ways we can help, um, help tackle that. Yeah, you think, and as as we said, that is a really, a really huge proportion. But I think what is fantastic about this research is that now we know, and obviously, you know, all no research is perfect, um, and and all research will have its flaws, but it's heartening to see quantitative data that helps us unpick that story, and as you said, point to some solutions that could be quite obvious, straightforward, and that already exist, um, rather than, oh, God, this feels like a huge issue, and where do we even begin to start to solve it? Um, it seems like the answers are pretty obvious, and maybe some of this can be factored into the uh, 10-year reform plan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And a, a little question that they put in the Telegraph article, which I've heard before many times, maybe you can all answer it. Do you think patients should be fined for missing appointments? Yes or no? Actually, I don't know. I think, I think no, because I would say coming back to health inequity, generally, and this is obviously a, a, a generalisation, but the people who have the worst health um, and would potentially struggle with some of those issues we talked about with with even getting to appointments are going to be those who when when money is a an issue um and actually adding extra financial anxiety for them feels inappropriate um and i think for those where money anxiety isn't an issue it depends how much you charge but you know was it Rishi Sunak who suggested £10 or something? Um, for like, for people who can afford it, £10 isn't enough to make people care. Um, and I mean, I get texts through for all the appointments that I've been going to that tells me, um, please attend, 
because this appointment costs £160 and is therefore valuable to us. Um, and it surprises me, actually, that a, an appointment is only £160. I will say that much. But I think if you were to disincentivize people with that real cost, perhaps for those who had more disposable income, that that would feel more painful than £10. But I just think it's such a complex thing. That I it just doesn't feel appropriate to me. But Hugh, I mean, you've you've worked a lot in social mobility in particular and across some of these issues. What what do you think? Should we be should we be finding people? I mean, I think inherently what what's the, the information that's missing from this survey is that is exactly what we've kind of discussed, which is that you know, I mean, here we go. Doctor, doctor can are rolling out the DNA predictor, which helps hospitals predict which patients are most likely to miss an appointment. What we don't have is that breakdown of what does that look like in terms of health inequalities. How far from the hospital are they? I mean, we probably talked. You know, I, I mean, I've missed part of part of this conversation because of my earlier issues, but uh, we probably talked about you know what, what it is that's driving and how hard it is to actually get to places. And I think. Anything that disincentivizes people from using health that they might need is not a good thing. I don't think people are inherently going out booking appointment and wasting time. Um, and the people who would be most affected by a policy like that are going to be those who need the most help or who need access to health. I mean, um, social inequality is an indicator of poor health or and um, you know increases that likelihood. So I think we are just it's it's not the right policy um i do think it's very interesting that workplace issues pop up on this uh on this survey um not least given so how many of the nhs change platform suggestions are 24 hour 7 um gp access which is an a hospital access which is sort of, maybe there's some deeply impractical solution they need to come up to address that i'd also on a very separate tangent be very interested to see what the results of this survey would be like in any other year, um, particularly from the travel side, where there's been a lot of industrial action um, that will have very likely influenced this. I've almost missed hospital appointments this year because of industrial action and not necessarily being super clear on it. So I think there are some, it's an interesting year for this, for these results to come out. Yeah, I think it perfectly illustrates, though, how multifactorial this is. There's so many elements to this. And in some ways, that can yeah disincentivize looking for a solution because there is no one big solution. But hopefully, you know, we can use this information to our advantage and take take it for what it is, but it can create a bit of momentum for change and getting the right people support to get the right care that they need. Um, with solutions that we already have in place um, that, do that doesn't need to be a huge lift or burden on the NHS, which we know is a huge concern right now. All right, on to our last, arguably penultimate story of the day. But this one is for our global listeners. You've probably had enough of hearing about the NHS for one week. So we are going to talk about... Amazon One Medical's latest move in healthcare. Um, I feel like they're in and out like a yo-yo. But this one, this one is about their AI tools, which they say can reduce healthcare administrative tasks by 40%. Now, our regular listeners and subscribers will know that generative AI co-pilot AI in general is a favorite topic of this podcast. And so we have, of course, intentionally chosen this one so that we can extract some of the views that Amy can bring to the table, because we know that you're all tired of hearing Hugh, myself, James, harp on about AI, question whether it's an overused, an overused term, how meaningless it might be, the ethical and moral arguments. We're going to change it up. We're going to keep it fresh. Amy. You had some questions on this one. Why don't you take it away? Thanks. Um, well, my fir the first thing I thought when I saw the headline without even reading the story was around privacy because of uh, Amazon Alexa, because of those stories, I think it was last year, um, privacy and data, um, and also just that Amazon as a 
huge giant company is kind of dipping into this space as well, like from a brand perspective um, and the kind of motivations behind that. So those are, those are my key questions um, looking at the headline and I don't have all the answers, but um, it would be good to hear your thoughts too. And um, yeah, I, I'm just, I think it's great, obviously in a very general sense that we are, that companies are getting involved in using and utilizing the kind of weighting of the workforce and the kind of power that they have behind their brand to enter into a space which is going to help doctors, um, supposedly reducing burdens and um, admin, which obviously nobody nobody likes. But whether ha- like how that actually translates in practice, um, yeah. I, I'm not totally sure. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm interested to hear your thoughts too. I guess from my point of view, it was, I mean, Amazon here talk about about three or four different offerings. <clears throat> One, two, three, four, five, five different offerings about how they're using AI in healthcare. All super admirable. And I think to be honest, this this is interesting, not interesting news, it's, it's news. Um, it's probably to be expected given the moves we've seen, the likes of Google and Microsoft, the moves that they've been making um, in the AI space. So it, it, I guess it feels like an, a natural next step and something of a punt and an experiment to an extent for Amazon um, or they're the kind of next, the next iteration, I suppose, of their adventures in healthcare. Um, so... <laughs> They have um, a proprietary electronic health record system. They have an AWS health scribe. So that's the kind of co-pilot um, sort of tool, which is capturing the context of conversations with patients and then clinicians review and approve notes before they, they get submitted. Um, there's another one that read labels and summarizes medical records that f- come from outside of that Amazon One Medical platform. Um, so it can screen it, like results, test results, and other things. Um, they also have a messaging tool, sending messages out to patients. Um, and also care teams can customize those messages. And then they have another one, which is around assessing patient need and then basically triaging them to the right place. So none of this feels particularly groundbreaking, if I'm honest. Um, I would say the most groundbreaking is probably the co-pilot, but even then, co-pilots are 10 a penny now. Um, You know, whether, particularly in the US, uh, which is where I think probably these technologies are likely to be be used the most. Um, I just, think it's kind of par for the course and Amazon probably needed to do this to keep up with the big tech race Um, and it feels a little bit behind um, where perhaps some of the other big tech companies are Um, but I think also it's interesting to see that they're giving this kind of one platform or or toolbox approach I guess um, for clinicians and healthcare providers Um, so it's not just you know well, I guess they can kind of pick and choose, you know, the bits that are relevant to them or, but they're not necessarily having to sift through different companies that provide each of these solutions. They, they have this one-stop shop, but again, I don't know if that's a good thing for innovation, competition, um, and all of that kind of thing. Hugh, we talk about this all the time. What do you reckon? So, I mean, like you, I've completely lost track of what Amazon's doing in healthcare at any given moment. It feels like it's 17th time lucky with this one, but I'm I'm interested. I'm I'm really interested in this one because I think Amy, you're absolutely right on that. Like um, the sort of patient security and the data security piece, there is that kind of inherent brand challenge for something like this when it comes to Amazon. And Jeff, you're absolutely, you know, it it is that you know, are they doing anything absolutely new? And I think the argument probably is, no, they're not doing anything new. That consolidation piece, I think, is very interesting though. And I think when we look at large U.S. healthcare institutions and hospital groups and networks within the U.S. It's it is so many of the big platforms that are used in healthcare have got there because they were doing something else entirely at the same time, 
And Amazon, for many of these hospitals, will already have something like AWS hosting and AWS as their cloud kind of core infrastructure in a lot of these um, a lot of these institutions. And being able to say, oh, well, we're already supplying you your core infrastructure. Well, we've got something that works perfectly with it. We can give you a suite of solutions that replace all of the little startups or, you know, scale ups that are trying to do what what you're trying to do. We've worked with them. We've probably seen how it works and and you know, we know the kind of minutia. I think there's a real chance that much like Oracle's growth was sort of driven with that that piece, Amazon um reach into healthcare could be really boosted by just rocking up to market with something that gets the job done in a single suite and ties in with what these hospitals are already using as their their kind of core infrastructure. And I'd be very interested to see at this, not, you know, not even with the healthcare side, I'd be very interested to see what the market share of AWS is in US hospital networks. Because if it's as big as it probably is, it won't be a hard sell for their sales teams. Um, Because ultimately, so many hospital networks are looking for something innovative, but proven that works together. And with a provider that they, they trust. And if you're looking at a lot of the others that might be going, you know, might be acquired by someone else, might move around, might do other things, or is it a choice between when it's your clinical scribe or co-pilot, is it a choice between a bridge or K or all of these possible options? And Amazon comes in and says, well, we're here, we can help. I know I'd be tempted mm-hmm. to go Amazon. It's the, same, it's the same reason a lot of books come from Amazon. <laughs> I think that's the interest, like when you think of Amazon as a brand, you think of efficiency, speed, like these things which are quite valuable in this space. Um, So yeah, it's interesting to see how that will kind of play out uh, at a brand level. Yeah, I think also though, when you think of Amazon, you don't necessarily think of quality. Um, And I think that's interesting. And that's not a criticism, but you know, it's well known that Jeff Bezos was looking exactly to achieve what you've just what you've just said, which is speed and efficiency. Um, and I think for the most part that's great, but obviously the quality piece does is important um, in healthcare because lives are at risk. But equally, I think to your earlier point, where you maybe querying um, around cybersecurity and that kind of thing. I actually think that for a lot of these big tech companies, they've they've all had their fair share of controversy around cybersecurity and privacy. And they'll all argue that it's a different part of the business and, you know, they, they've learned lessons and that kind of thing. But to be honest, I actually think that there comes a point where these brands are so big that actually it doesn't affect them in any significant way. They're they're kind of untouchable from that perspective. And to Hugh's point, that makes them a known quantity. And I think from that perspective, a very attractive option to health systems, to hospitals and hospital networks, where that that brand recognition comes with some inherent trust, despite the fact that you know they're not immune to, to controversy. Um, there's always a way to kind of talk your way out of it um from that brand perspective but there's so much that they are well known for in in many positive ways so i think yeah it, it's an interesting one for sure yeah definitely i think yeah i mean they, they only have to convince those decision makers um don't they but then there's the, the public i guess the public's involvement as well and whether they'd be sort of notified mm-hmm. around that amazon's involved if especially if there's like patient note taking and that kind of privacy mm-hmm. stuff and um but yeah very interesting story indeed that's a great point actually but then when i think about like new ehr systems for instance being implemented in the nhs um would we be uh, would we be notified if cerner were perhaps taking over an oracle or taking over our ehr i don't know that we would i mean i did get a notification when my my gp practice moved over to Acurix and were using that system. But I think it was because it was entirely new. Um, but yeah. it's, a, it's a good point. Should the public have that information and or like be proactively, not that I think it's hidden from them, but should they proactively be informed and, and have a say? 
will be able to raise concerns. I think the information should be there if they want it. Um, I think it would be yeah difficult to notify people just from a logistical standpoint. But um, yeah, I think especially if like you're t- if talking on a patient level, if you're going into a consultation and it's being recorded through you know na- note taking um, capabilities. They probably should be notified that that's happening, but whether they'd say this is an Amazon product is a, is a whole nother level of it, which probably won't need to be disclosed necessarily. Also, they might decide that they want to change the company in, in which, yeah, it would just be a logistical nightmare. But it's only when something goes wrong, uh, you know, data leaked, then they find out it's an Amazon product, then, that, then that's when the public would most likely get involved. Um, in the discussion but yeah it's it is an interesting point yeah and i mean absolutely people should obviously be they must they should be able to consent to um obviously conversations that are recorded or where you've got co-pilots listening in and that kind of thing but you know i on the flip side the other side of the argument that i just made was that actually are patients informed enough to be able to decide whether amazon is better than cerner I wouldn't be able to tell you, and we work in this space. Um, and so I think often it goes on gut feel or controversy. Um, and then I guess that creates more drama and admin for um, the health system or healthcare providers. But if you were to find out that your data was going to Amazon and you hadn't consented yeah, to that, point. and yeah. you didn't want it to go to Amazon for, for whatever reason, mm. it might make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, very fair. Ah, well, we continue to ponder. We continue to ponder. We have not solved the universe's problems in AI and healthcare. So you're going to have to listen in for at least another week um, until we get a little bit closer to doing so. But before we finish, I just wanted to touch on a final story, which is from The Times. And it is an interview with one of our good friends, Dr. Helen O'Neill from Hertility. Um, Lots of you may know she recently had a baby and she has done an interview with uh, the team at The Times talking about how painful uh, a fundraising for women, for a women's health startup was as painful as giving birth. Now, I have yet to give birth. Um, I did an NCT class the other day and talked all about labour and giving birth and I came away feeling a little bit queasy. Um, And so that sounds like it is quite painful. And um, we all know the challenges in, um, or the data at least, around the how just how little uh, venture capital does get deployed into women's health companies. So I can well imagine some of those challenges. The reason I wanted to talk about it today was that I think we know that uh, this is a huge widespread challenge. And it's not just women's health, but it's also female founders. We know that there are challenges, for example, in venture capital, in private equity, where there's this imbalance in representation from Um, women who are in check writing positions, there are not that many of them, TLDR. Um, And I think it's also recognised that that is part of the issue, um, which means that we don't see some of these women's health and female founded companies receiving the funding that, that they deserve. And so I want to take the opportunity to point you to a survey that is being conducted by Kavanaugh Health and some really, truly powerhouses from across the industry um, to help understand women's experiences of working in venture capital, um, both past and present at all levels, whether you're early in your career, you've retired or you've left, you're doing something different and to understand um, yeah, women's perspectives and those experiences with the intention of shaping an initiative that can support women in these spaces in a really tangible way um, and bring more women into those decision making and check writing roles so that we can actually see Um, a difference right across the ecosystem. I think it's abundantly clear that more diverse, whether they're executive teams, whether they're investment boards, we know that more diverse teams um, make for uh, better 
commercial results and better outcomes for everyone across the ecosystem. So if you are involved in venture capital, whether you're male, female, identify in any other way, please do share your experiences through that survey. Um, it will be really important in, in helping shape that initiative and finally moving the needle so that we can maybe talk about some different data points that we can get really excited about rather than that annoying 2% that doesn't seem to change. So until next week, thank you, Amy, so much for joining us for your first ever Health Tech Pigeon podcast. Certainly will not be the last. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. I can say that you passed your initiation with flying colours and uh, we'll see you back on the airwaves sometime very soon. And our listeners, see you next week. Thank you.